James 5, and we will read the final two verses of the book, verses 19 and 20. It's one sentence, actually. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. This is how James ends his letter. It's very different from other letters in the New Testament. For example, if you take Paul's letters, which, where he closes in a much more official manner with blessings and uh, doxologies or uh, sending greetings to people. If you just go through Romans 16, which is the final chapter in Romans, the entire chapter, he, ne he, he mentions by name over 30 people. Where he says, say hi to this person, and that person, and blessings to him, and all these things that he has to say. James doesn't do that. James says what he has to say, and ends it. Um, the entire book, uh, James has been teaching about practical Christianity, practical truth, uh, how a Christian should live his life, what a Christian should look like. And the final thing that he has to tell us is that if we see someone among you, so we're talking about someone who's from the church, who strays from the truth, it is our responsibility to try and bring him back. To tell him to not leave. Do not abandon the truth. Do not abandon the gospel because there is nowhere else to go. Christ is our only hope. So this passage is, is we want to be specific. This is not about evangelizing in general. This is specifically about those who have been among us who are straying or leaving and who were once part of the Christian group, and those are the ones that we're talking about to try and restore them. Now he starts off by saying, Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth. Let's stop right there for a moment. The, the Greek word that is used there for wander, is the word planao, comes from, well, that's, the, that's the, uh, the verb, the noun is plani, just interestingly enough, uh, plani, come, it's related to the word planitis, which is planet, which is to wander. You know, you look at the sky, and there's certain stars that are fixed, but there are others that wander across the sky. And so they're called planets, wanderers. So, but this, <laughs> that sounds nice and beautiful, but in the New Testament, whenever you read the word plani, or plan now. It's very bad, very serious. Um, uh, it's it's n usually not used for small matters. It's used for very serious matters, deception and apostasy. Um, let, me, let me just read you a couple of verses so that you see how this word plan now is used. Um, for example, in Matthew 22, Jesus is dealing with the Sadducees, the Sadducees who were not the most conservative religious people of Judaism, and uh, they did not believe a bunch of stuff from the Bible. They did not believe in the resurrection, and when they confronted Jesus about this, he said to them, you are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. Well, when he says you are mistaken, that's planel. You are wandering off. You do not know the power of God. You do not know the scriptures. So someone who is not fixed upon God and upon the scriptures and is wandering away. That's what he's talking about. Uh, Matthew 24. Jesus is talking about how there will be uh, false Christs trying to deceive people. He says, many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. Again, that word deceive is they will make many to wander. It's a very serious thing. Um, there's one here which in 2 Peter chapter 2, which is specifically about uh, people who have left the Christian church and he's talking about false teachers. 
And he says, They have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. These people have forsaken the right way and they've gone astray. They've wandered away from the truth. Um, many times, with this word is used, it's very serious and it very often refers to what we would call apostasy. Um, apostasy, just so that you know what the word means, it's not a derogatory term. If I call someone an apostate, I'm not being mean. It's a technical term. It refers to a person who once confessed faith in Christ who no longer does. That's an apostate. An apostate is someone who confessed Christ, got baptized, was a member of the church, and one day gives it up and leaves. That's what an apostate is. And James is speaking of people here who, I, I believe that's what we're talking about, people who have strayed from the truth. The truth is Christ, the gospel, the word of God. And this, these, person are want, these people are wandering away. Um, you read about people like this in the Bible, and there have been people like this for 2,000 years. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, he speaks of Hymen, Paul speaks of Hymenaeus and Philetus who have strayed from the truth. And they were teaching that the resurrection... Not Jesus' resurrection, the general resurrection, had already happened. And they were overthrowing the faith of many. At the end of cha uh, at the, in the last uh, chapter of 2 Timothy, you know, Paul is in his dungeon and he's about to be killed. And he's, he's saying, only Luke is with me. Everyone else who was with me has either left or some ministry or has abandoned me. And he says, Demas has forsaken me having loved this present age. That's a sad statement right there. You have someone who was, was in the ministry and he has left it all because he loved this present age. He was not concerned with the kingdom of God and the age to come, but he loved this world. And it's always sad when someone abandons Christ because he is the only one who can save. Um... Every commentary that I read on these two verses <laughs> got very technical and said, well, there's two ways to stray from the truth. It says, you can stray from the truth morally when you start living in immoral ways, or you can stray from the truth doctrinally when you start believing false things. And I'm, I'm reading that and I'm like, yeah, okay, I get that, that's true. But, let me just say that I think the two are related. <laughs> I think they go together. What you believe determines how you live. Um, so if, a person, if you see a person who is straying from the truth doctrinally, like, well, you know, I, I don't really know if I can believe what the Bible is saying here. And maybe the Bible is wrong here. Or, you know, I don't know if I believe in the sufficiency of Scripture and stuff like that. It's not, it wouldn't be at all surprising if then you see them straying off in the way that they live. Because their basis of how to live has, they don't hold to that anymore. It happens all the time. Now, something that I need to talk about is Someone may say, uh, Nico, wait a minute. You're talking about all these people mentioned in the Bible and other people that we know who have abandoned the Christian faith, who said they believed in Christ and then they've left. But what about eternal security? I thought you believed in eternal security. Are you telling me that these people have lost their salvation? Because um, look at this passage. Because a lot of people use this passage to say, no, eternal security is not true. Because he addresses them as brethren. If anyone among you... So we're talking about people that he calls brethren who are in the church. People who, if they don't come back, what's going to be the outcome? Because it says if they do come back, uh, their soul will be saved from death. So they say, look, if they don't come back, that means that their soul will perish and die. So... Has this, does this mean that a person can be a Christian and lose his salvation? And, ta and die eternally? <sighs> no. And let, let's talk about this for, for a moment. Um, when the New Testament writers address a church, address a group of people, they very charitably <laughs> will call them brethren. If I go to a church, I'm not going to say, well... 
some of you who are brethren and the rest of you who are not, they, he addresses them as brethren, but they know very well the writers of the New Testament and every preacher who will stand up in front of a group knows that even though hopefully most of them there are believers, some of them are not. James knows that there are people in this group that are not believers. He talked about people who seem religious, but their religion is useless. He talked about people who say they believe in one God, but their faith is nothing more than the faith of demons. He knows that there are people like this in the church. He knows that it's very possible to have people who claim to believe, and then one day stray and leave and die eternally. The proof that you are truly saved is not making a confession of faith. It is perseverance in the faith. It is possible for a true believer to stray for a while. Look at David, who committed adultery and then had Uriah killed. You know, this is, he, it's not that he was... It, he was a believer who went way off and God sent Nathan to bring him back. Look at Peter who denied Christ, swore, never knew him, and then came back. It's very possible for a believer to stray for a while, but God will bring him back as this is James's hope. If you see someone straying, try and bring him back. But it's also possible to have someone in the church who confesses to know Christ who is not a believer and leaves and never comes back. And I believe that that person who never comes back was never saved to begin with. Now, when I say if someone never comes back he was never saved to begin with, people say, well, isn't that... People who don't agree say, well, isn't that convenient? Isn't that... That's too easy. Uh, I don't care if it sounds easy or convenient. That's what the Bible says. And I would like to show you that. Please go to 1 John chapter 2. We were in James. Just go 1 Peter, 2 Peter, 1 John. 1 John chapter 2. He is talking about people who have left the Christian church. People who are teaching heresy. People who he calls antichrists. And this is what he has to say about them. Look at verse 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. Let me say that again so that we don't miss it. They went out from us. So they, they were part of us. They, they, they were part of the group. They went out from us. And they've left. But they were not of us. So they've left, but he says, they, they, they weren't really one of us. They didn't really belong to us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. Which means that if they were part of us, if they were true Christians, if they truly belonged to the church, they would have continued. They would have persevered. That is the proof that they are part of us, that they are true Christians. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. The fact that they left proves, shows, reveals that they didn't belong to us. A person does not lose his salvation. Listen, we, <laughs> I would like to have numerous lessons on this. We could go on forever because the Bible has so much to say about this. This is what we need to understand. And then I'll move on. Salvation is the work of God. It's not something that you do. It's something that God does. We need to stop talking about all about, you know, I know we say it, but I got saved and I could lose my salvation. No. God is the one who saves you. If you got lost, that means that He failed. Because it's His work. What does Philippians chapter 1 say? He, this is the work of God, not ours, He who began a good work in you will finish it. Matthew 7, many will come to me on that day, saying, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and in your name done many, many wonders? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Not I used to know you once. 
But now you've left and I don't know you anymore. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You were never part of the group, even though you said you were. Romans 8, there's the, 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 what we call the golden chain of redemption. Those whom God foreknew, He predestined to the likeness of His Son. And those He predestined, the same ones He also called. And those He called, He also justified. And those He justified, He also glorified. No one falls off the bus. Same group from beginning to end. If you are justified, you will be glorified. End of story. One last one, John chapter 10. Jesus says, my sheep, my sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. The Greek there is umi, double negative. Double negative in the, in the Greek does not make a positive, it means, an, it means an extra negative. So, they shall never, ever perish. No one can pluck them out of my hand. My Father who is greater than all has given them to me. No one can pluck them out of His hand. My Father and I are one. And I could go on and on and on and on. So James, to go back to James, even though God, even though God knows the hearts of all people, even though God knows who His people are, we don't. We don't know the hearts of people. And so when we see someone who strays from the truth, there's two possibilities. He could be a believer who has fallen into sin, or he could be an unbeliever. Either way, we don't know. So either way, it's our job to try and bring them back. It's our job to try and say, don't leave. There is nowhere else to go. Don't waste your life. Don't reject Christ. Repent of your sins. Come back. Christ is your only hope. This, the world doesn't see it this way, but listen to me. This is an act of love. The world thinks that we hate them. When we say to someone, repent, they think that we hate them. This is an act of love trying to bring someone to salvation, to life. I want to show you a passage, please. Please go to Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus 19. This is the passage, let me just tell you really quick, this is the passage that has the famous verse, love thy neighbor. Most people think that the Old Testament is this mean book, but the New Testament is this wonderful loving book that says love thy neighbor. Well, actually, whenever you read New Testament writers saying love thy neighbor, they're quoting Leviticus. Okay? Leviticus 19. Uh, let's look at verse 17. He says, You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall surely rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Let's think about this for a moment. That little section begins with, Don't hate your brother. Would anyone have a problem with that? <laughs> of course not. And it ends with, Love your neighbor. So in between the don't hate and the love, it says, Rebuke him. And don't bear sin. Don't put up with sin. Why? Because sin leads to death. And hell. So if you love someone, you don't want them to die. You don't want them to go to hell. So you rebuke them about their sin. Now I understand, I understand that some people don't go about this the best way. Some people can be rude. Some people can be obnoxious. Some people can be very annoying. I understand that. And we need to be very careful. We need wisdom to know how to approach each person in each situation. But... We cannot be like the people who say, you know what, I love him so I won't say anything. You know what, that's his right to just go do whatever he wants to do. Well, let me just say first of all, it's no one's right to sin against God. Okay, first of all. Uh, second of all, you know, when, when people say, um, you know what, let's just, let's just, I love him so I don't want to say anything. I'll just love him unconditionally and, you know, let him do his own thing. Is 
is it loving to sit back and do nothing as they go to hell? Yes, we need to be loving, we need to be kind, but we need to be firm and say, if you reject the truth, if you reject Christ, if you reject the gospel, if you abandon it all, you will perish. That is the truth. Why do you think Christ came? To pay for our sins. So that we wouldn't have to die for our sins. And the hope is that they will listen and return. Verse 20, he says, Oh, I'm sorry, go back to James chapter 5. He says, uh, To the person, uh, this is addressed to the person who will bring the straying one back. He says, Let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Uh, let me quickly point out that, you know, it says, he who brings him back, you know, will, will save his soul from death. We are not the ones who save people's souls. It's God who saves people's souls. It's Christ through his sacrifice that saves people's souls. But God uses means. God uses us to call people to himself. Through our preaching, our witnessing, our evangelizing, he uses us to draw people to himself. And let me just say that is a great honor and privilege that God bestows upon us to be a part of bringing people out of death onto life. Um, this is our job. I, if you, uh, what passage that I love is from Acts chapter 10 and 11 with uh, Cornelius. The angel appears to Cornelius... And he says, call for Peter, and he'll bring you a message through which you will be saved. And so he does, and Peter comes and preaches the gospel, and Cornelius and his household get saved. And the thing that I, I always love about that is, the angel doesn't preach the gospel. He could. He could say, let me tell you all about Christ, but he doesn't do that. God wants us to be the ones who evangelize and tell other people wants us to be the ambassadors of Christ to go and tell others because angels are not in the same place that we are angels, good angels we're not talking about demons angels uh, have never sinned and in need of salvation shall we say but we are the ones who have experienced the salvation of God and we are to go to others to tell them what Christ does so if a person hopefully returns Two things will happen. Number one, his soul will be saved from death. Everyone dies physically, but there is such a thing as Revelation calls a second death, which is hell. And I know whenever you talk about hell, people get uncomfortable. It's not a pleasant subject, but the Bible talks about hell. Jesus talked about hell all the time. Jesus spoke about hell more than anyone else in the entire Bible. Because that's why he came. He came to save us. He is the only way of salvation. Uh, in Acts chapter 5, what does it say? There is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. Other than the name of Jesus Christ. So first of all, if a person returns to the truth, his soul will be saved from death. I don't have any more notes on that. I'm just sitting here contemplating that. We don't appreciate that enough. Those of us who have trusted in Christ, we have been saved from eternal death. And we... We need to be more thankful than we are. And second of all, his sins will be covered. His sins will be covered. It says sins will be forgiven. That's what it means. Those two terms, covered and forgiven, are, are used together all the time. Psalm 32 says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Psalm 85 says, You have forgiven the iniquity of your people. You have covered all of their sins. 
the Bible uses the most wonderful language about God forgiving sins. How He has thrown them behind His back. How He, he will no longer remember our sins. That He has thrown them into the depths of the sea. That they, our sins are separated from us as far as the east is from the west. I love that because east and never west, the two points of the horizon, they never meet. They will always be apart. God has taken our sin away from us. Micah chapter 7 ends by saying, Who is a God like you? Pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance. James, for five chapters, has been instructing us on how to live a Christian life. And while we are to watch and take heed for ourselves, we're not alone in this. We're part of a family. We're part of a church. And therefore, we are not only to look out for ourselves, but we are to look out for others also and their Christian life. Sin leads to eternal death. We should be concerned about our sin. And James wants us to be concerned about our brothers and sisters' sin also. And if a person who calls himself a brother or a sister is departing from the faith, James tells us to tell him to come back. Don't commit spiritual suicide. Don't refuse the covering for sin. There is only one way to life. There is only one way to escape death. And that is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for your attention.